so in the last session today, Jesse and I are going to share the time to talk a little bit about applications of the kinds of methods that Mac talked about this morning in economics and, and social science. Uh, and and I, the, the key thing to keep in mind, I think, or one of the themes of this is these methods are primarily, in the way they've been developed, in the main kinds of applications, primarily about prediction. They're dimension reduction algorithms for taking some high dimensional data and reducing it to a lower dimension. And those methods have played a relatively small role in economics relative to the role that they've played in statistics and other parts of the world because economics tends to be primarily about causal inference and less about prediction per se. So part of the theme here is just to get a feel for what are the places where currently and potentially in the future those kinds of predictive methods have value. How do people use these kinds of things? Tomorrow is really going to be devoted to the, the methods which are specific to the case where we want to do causal inference, kind of derive from these methods. And so uh, Chris Hansen will talk tomorrow about those kinds of applications. Okay. So I think broadly, when are these data mining kind of methods used in economics? We can think of three categories of applications. The first is cases where prediction per se is what we want to do. So there's, for example, a literature on macroeconomic forecasting. Second is cases where describing the relationships between the x variables and the y variables is what is of interest. So an example is uh, the, the literature on genetics that Matt talked about, where a question of interest is just, are there genes that determine a particular behavior? Are there genes that determine a particular characteristic? Which genes are those? Describing those kinds of relationships. Uh, and finally, and this will kind of relate into what we talk about tomorrow, we want to take the high dimensional x, collapse to this lower dimensional z, so we can then use z in some subsequent analysis. Include it as a control variable, look at it as a left-hand side variable, use it as an instrument, and so forth. So what we want to do today is first, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the kinds of data kinds of large data sets that have been used and the kinds of applications that people have used, not talking in any detail about the specific methods that people have used. That's just a kind of quick overview uh, to, to kind of give you a flavor for people who haven't seen those things. And then we're going to spend some time going into some detail about one specific application, one specific data source, which is text, and ways in which these methods are applied to text and ways that text has been used in social science and economics. So I'm going to organize this overview in terms of data sources, examples of high dimensional data uh, that are relevant. So one obvious kind of high dimensional data that people have used is web searches, data from Google in particular on search behavior. So think about all of the searches that are being generated every day. This graph is searches from Google Trends, searches for the phrase big data over time. Uh, and so th this data set, typically we're, we're looking at searches grouped in time, time series of searches, or searches grouped geographically. And so you can think of an observation as a, you know, the, the n dimension here is time or time cross geography, and the p dimension, which is really big, is all possible terms that people could search for. So on this day, how many people searched for big data, how many search for other things. Um, this is searches for big data by geography. A lot of people search for that in India, it turns out. So what are the applications, potentially, of this kind of data and, and predictive methods applied to it? So one example that many of you are probably familiar with is, is Google flu trends. Uh, so Google, in partnership with uh, some statisticians, developed a tool to, whose purpose is to predict the outbreak and course of flu epidemics and the location of flu epidemics so that, so that treatment can be uh, targeted and so forth. So it turns out that searches, the frequency of searches for things like sneezing, flu shot, flu medication, this kind of thing, there are a bunch of Google searches that are highly predictive of the outbreak of flu out, 
of, of, of flu epidemics. And so though the, the CDC measures those things based on getting reports from doctors, those official measurements of, of flu rates have a long lag, and these tend to do much better and can be much faster. More related to economics, there's some recent work by Hal Varian and others looking at predicting this kind of pure forecasting exercise. Can we predict things like unemployment, retail sales, consumer confidence, et cetera, from searches? And here again, the, the, you know, we measure these things, but we measure them in a very costly way with surveys and other things so that at best we have a small sample of people that we're using to measure things at a monthly frequency or a quarterly frequency. With the, the search data, you can fed through a predictive algorithm like the kind of thing that Matt was talking about. You can predict these things at a much higher frequency and much higher levels of geography. So those are sort of pure predictive applications related to that. The, the, another one of the things in that literature that people have tried to forecast are consumer confidence numbers. And one of the interesting aspects of those papers is this, this kind of descriptive question of what, you know, what is consumer confidence actually? What is that survey measure? People go out and ask, how are confident you about the economy? What is that really picking up? What is the variation that drives that? And looking just descriptively at the search terms that predict that, you see it tends to be a bunch of, you can see what the predictive algorithm loads on in terms of people's searches, and it tends to be a bunch of things about basically financial, uh, you know, people's investments and financial behavior. And so if you look at that paper, there's, there's uh, some drilling down into what that consumer confidence number might mean. Um, and third, thinking about this data as an input to subsequent analysis, an example of that is something that we, we it's hard to measure in the world that we care about for economics is corruption. So there are a lot of studies of corruption at the country level that are based on surveys where people are asked, you know, both asked how corrupt you think your country is, how long does it take to uh, start a new business, how many people do you have to bribe, and so forth. So we have kind of coarse country level measures for corruption. It's, we, we don't have the ability to measure corruption. There's no standard data set for corruption at any subnational level. So there's a paper by Saez and Simonson that says, that observes that with search data, basically looking at the frequencies of, frequency of searches for a country's name along with words like corruption, graft, and so forth, you can construct an index which is highly correlated with the survey measures at the country level. So looking at the countries who are often searched alongside the word corruption turn out to be corrupt on the standard measures. You can now apply that same algorithm to cities and look at frequency of searches for city names alongside corruption uh, and construct a variable now where we can measure something we couldn't measure before. So then they go on. You, you, could, you could, in that paper, they just stop at measuring that, but you could imagine now going on and using that to ask what are the determinants of corruption at the city level, what are the effects of corruption at the city level. Um, a re, a, another example of this is this Stevens and Davidovitz paper uh, recently using searches to measure racial animus, kind of predictors, indicators of racism at the local level, and ask whether race had some effect on a voting for Obama in the most recent or in the 2008 election. OK. So Google searches is one s sort of data. A second one that Matt talked about is genetic data. I'll go through this quickly because he mentioned it. But this is one of the main places where these high dimensional methods have been uh, developed and applied. The left hand side here is some physical or behavioral outcome. The right hand side are all of these SNPs. The data set here is n equals 10,000, and p is you know, something on the order of 2.5 million. So this is a case where you have more variables than you have observations, typically. And uh, we want to predict these outcomes. So what are applications of this in, in, in economics? The, there's, there have been a number of papers written applying these methods to look at genetic predictors for economically relevant behavior. A lot of them have been written by David Cesarini, Dan Benjamin, co-authors. So th they look at. To what extent are there SNPs that predict things like risk aversion, social preferences, how people make financial decisions, political preferences, entrepreneurship, educational attainment, and so forth. And so I would, I would put the, if you look at these papers, 
it's largely in this kind of descriptive category. The thing we're really interested in, in some sense in these papers, is are the, do these things have a genetic basis at all? Are there genetic predictors of them that tells us, that informs us about what, what risk aversion is about, how we might want to model it, and so forth. You could also think about if you then know, if you, if you really can measure these genetic characteristics of people, then using these things as controls in some additional analysis. The interesting point in this literature, which Matt already mentioned, is it, it's, it's, it's a fantastic example of why we need good statistics and good statisticians to tell us how to do this instead of just sort of doing it on our own, because the, the, this whole early wave of research, both a number of the papers by economists, but also lots of papers by other people, turn out to be largely false discovery. So there are a huge number of published results saying this intelligence or risk aversion or various behaviors are correlated with this particular gene or that particular gene. And subsequent studies that have tried to replicate those things have shown basically none of them replicate. And if you go back and think about the underlying out of your 2.5 million genes, what is the likelihood, what share of them have a true causal relationship, then the p-value that you need to apply to have a reasonable false discovery rate is incredibly low. And so once you sort of do that power calculation, it's not at all surprising that that's what people found. Another kind of large p data set to think about is medical claims. So a lot of people who work in, in the health area have used data from Medicare. This is kind of a standard workhorse data set in health economics. And, and, and the Medicare data is basically claim level data from Medicare. And there's similar claim level data from other insurers from lots of other sources. So 10 years of Medicare data is big. It's on the order of 100 terabytes of data for all of the claims filed for Medicare over those periods, and it's high dimensional. A, claim, a, a single claim is a function of a patient, a doctor, a hospital, how much was paid, and then in particular, what was the treatment given, which is something which, you know, basically binary indicators for, for many thousands and thousands of kind of treatments. So this is super, super high dimensional data, and you, the, the, the question is, how can we reduce this dimensionality to a small set of variables that we can actually apply to models? So one of the data, one of the dimension reduction uh, tasks that has played a big role so far is trying to collapse all of this data into some single dimensional indicator of people's health or predicted spending. And then this is used in lots of ways in lots of papers. So there's the, Medicare produces risk scores based on not sophisticated data mining methods, but a kind of ad hoc criterion, which, are, which, which have some statutory meaning, and so they, they, they can't change very fast. But those are uh, basically weighting all of the different treatments you might have had in a particular way to try to predict your subsequent spending. Uh, and health. There's a Johns Hopkins model, which is much more sophisticated than that. There are lots and lots of these sorts of predictive algorithms applied to trying to trying to predict people's subsequent healthcare spending. Um, and these things, those variables, have been used extensively as inputs into subsequent analysis, uh, as control variables, as independent variables of interest, as mediators. Uh, so. Uh, like in this Einov and Finkelstein study, thinking about the risk score as a mediator of which health plan you choose, the health, how does health plan choice differ between healthier people and less healthy people. Um, in Ben Handel's job market paper, he uses this John Hopkins score as a measure of people's private information about health. You could see a lot of scope here for improving these, this dimension reduction in these data using more sophisticated methods. Um, very closely related, also in an insurance context, there's credit scoring. Credit scoring is another example of taking high dimensional data on all of people's financial behavior and collapsing it into a single dimensional score. Um, this is used for forecasting. Obviously, banks care about forecasting default risks. And credit scores have been used in, as input into lots of analysis. Uh, John Levin and Liran Einov have a series of papers where they, they look specifically at the 
proprietary credit scoring algorithm used by uh, kind of low-end auto dealer and trying to understand how they make money based on having a more sophisticated prediction algorithm than others. This Rajan Saru and Vig paper looks at how using a particular, if, if the market settles on a particular way to reduce dimensionality in deciding, for example, who to give mortgages to, what, to what extent does that cause perverse reactions because people start now loading on the things that enter the model and loading less on things that don't enter the model and deciding who to give a mortgage to or not. Um, online purchases, obviously there's a huge amount of data mining involved at companies like Amazon, Netflix, and eBay. Uh, they want to predict who's going to buy things, who they should target advertising to, and so forth. Um, and Matt already talked about this a little bit. Net Netflix had kind of famously a prize where people were invited to contribute algorithms to predict which movies that, uh, that people would want to buy using data mining algorithms. And there's this application to congressional roll call votes that, that Matt also talked about in political science, uh, using factor analysis to collapse all of the roll call votes into, into low dimensions and ask questions like, is there really just this left-right party dimension, or are there others? Do the others pop up at particular times? How has polarization, the extent to which Congress is really separated along party lines, changed over time, and so forth? So that's a, a selective tour of the places where these kinds of methods have been applied. And now I want to zoom in and talk in particular about the application to text. So there are lots of data sources that have become available with the advent of the internet and a lot of digital information where the data that we get fundamentally comes in the form of text. There's news text, there's a whole database of Google Books, which includes basically the text of all books ever written, content of web pages, congressional speeches, corporate filings, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth. There are lots of other data sets where the, the, they don't consist exclusively as of text, but text is a part of what's in the data. So think about looking at eBay listings. They have a lot of metadata, a lot of characteristics, which are numeric, but there's also a description field. And using that description in the analysis is potentially valuable. Um, those medical records we talked about, people tend to just use the coded numeric fields. But if you look at the underlying records that hospitals have, those include lots of free text fields as well. And there's scope for analyzing that text to add something to that analysis. Announcements of central banks, so on and so forth. Okay. So just a few things to say at a kind of high level about text analysis, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to talk about um, some of the, of, of the specific applications. So all, the first thing to know if you're sort of new to this is that essentially everywhere where text has been used as a data source in economics, people represent text as a vector of counts, a vector of counts of words or a vector of counts of n-grams, which are basically phrases, uh, one or two or three or four words. So we take a document that looks like that, and we represent it as just a vector. How many times did each word occur? So this picture shows this being applied to single words, but you could imagine counting sets of two-word phrases. So the phrase beginning God would appear once. The phrase God created would appear once. The phrase created the would appear once, and so forth. This seems like an incredibly crude representation of text. It ignores grammar. It ignores meaning. It ignores the fact that you can wor use the same word in different ways. It ignores the fact that putting one sentence before another has a different meaning. It ignores punctuation. It, it, it seems incredibly crude. And the kind of remarkable fact in this literature, not only the economics part, but the whole sort of computational linguistics literature is this representation does an incredibly good job of capturing the information in the data. And more, when people do a lot of work to try to add more sophistication to take account of things like, you know, when did you use this word in an ironic sense instead of a straightforward sense, or which meaning of this word we're using, the gain tends to be very small. So practically speaking, when people study text, they study vectors of counts for the most part. A second 
general point that we want to stress kind of throughout this discussion is in the idealized world of the statistics, we start with data which is n by p and we use an automated algorithm to collapse p into some lower dimension. In practice, inevitably, what actually happens is we start with a data set that is n by p where p is really, really, really big, the set of all variables that we could conceivably use, potentially, and all of their interactions and all of their squared terms and all of their set, set of potential variables is, in practice, incredibly big. We always do some first step of reducing that from you know, 3 million to 3,000 using as a kind of manual step using prior information and then we apply the automated methods to this kind of collapsed version of the data. So there is there is the science and there is the art and there's always in any paper that you read in this area there is always a substantial amount of before we did anything else we threw away a bunch of stuff because we thought it would be irrelevant and we threw away a bunch of stuff because it occurred rarely and we threw away a bunch of stuff because it was too difficult computationally uh, and and so that's important to keep in mind. So in, in the text context, we see you know, people often drop rare words. There's something called stop words, which are standard lists of incredibly common words, but that also do not have a particularly high ability to discriminate meaning. So things like articles and conjunctions that uh, we think are not really going to tell you somebody's ideology, whether they use the a lot or not. Um, but they cost your computer a lot of time because they occur, all, they occur frequently. There's something called stemming, which means combining things like economics, economic, and economically into one single word, because we know those basically have the same meaning. If you scrape data from the web, you might want to drop all of the HTML, because that's not that relevant, and so forth. So you know, the point to stress is just this is manual steps based on people's priors, and that there's always a back and forth between that and the automated part. Um, it's also worth noting that thus far in economics, the vast majority of work using text doesn't use any automated dimension reduction at all. So, so most of what people have, have done is we start with all of the possible words that could occur, and we just select a subset of them, a very small subset of them, that we're going to use as an index of the thing that we're trying to measure. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's if, if you have strong priors about what words are going to select the documents that, that, that you're interested in, then this will work much better than some more sophisticated method. So in that Saez and Simonson paper I mentioned where they're interested in corruption, they don't use any automated methods to figure out which words are going to best predict, best correlate with the corruption index at the country level. They just search for country name plus corruption. Um, in some of the work that Steve Davis has done uh, with Nick Bloom, they want to measure economic policy uncertainty over time in the news. To what extent are there news articles which are talking about uncertainty created by the fact that we don't know what the government is going to do? And they select a set of terms a priori like economic and policy and uncertainty that they think are going to capture that, and then do some work ex post to validate and verify that, in fact, that gives them back um, what they're looking for. There's a Luca and Trevi paper where they're categorizing uh, press releases, speeches from the, from the Federal Reserve, and they just look explicitly for phrases like hawkish, dovish, loose, tight, uh, and so forth. So th that's just to say, if you look at the literature, and I think this applies not only in text, but you know, in other places too. The, the, this sort of manual approach accounts for a lot of what people have done. There are a smaller number of papers using more sophisticated methods. I think the scope for more papers to use more sophisticated methods is probably high. Okay. And the final thing I'll say, and then I'll hand it over to Jesse, another just detail of the practical implementation of this that becomes very important when you're thinking about text is the, the representations that Matt talked about all begin from there's this matrix n by k of data x, and you have that. In the text context, that would mean the, there are all of these phrases that you want to count, and for every document, you have counts of all of those phrases. And it's easy to think about what you do 
in that context. The reality is in many of the situations that many of the contexts where people actually do this, you don't have access to the raw text. You cannot download the full matrix of Google searches. You cannot download the full text of all newspapers. You cannot download the full text of full counts of Google Books, although Google Books has made now n-gram counts, full n-gram counts available that makes that easier. So in practice, people are often ac accessing text via search interfaces. And that is a practical constraint. What that means is just you have to use some a priori judgment initially to narrow things down to some set of phrases, which is small enough that you can then run those as automated searches and then construct a matrix out of those searches. So either you know doing data, data mining algorithms and some external source to try to select what phrases are going to matter or doing it yourself. Uh, but this, is, this, this means that the, the actual analysis of text in many of these contracts has to start from a pretty small P. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Jesse. Okay, so the first set of applications uh, that we'll talk about to using text as data all fall under the umbrella of what some people call sentiment analysis. Okay, and this is going to look familiar from, uh, from some of the stuff that Taddy was talking about earlier. The basic template and sentiment analysis works like this. We have some outcome we care about, Y. We have a set of features, X. And then we have data. Usually we divide it into N objects we'll call training data. And then an N plus first object we'll call the target. So we're going to have N cases where we know both X and Y. Then we're going to have an M plus first case where we know X and we want to be able to say something about what Y is. Okay? And the classic example where actually a lot of this was developed is the context of your spam filter. Okay? How does a spam filter work? Okay? Basically you start with a training set of some number of emails. Each email is classified by some human as either spam or what's called in the industry ham, which is the opposite of spam, that's an email you want. And humans go, th go through any of these cases and classify emails as either emails that should be passed through to the user or emails that should be blocked by a filter. Okay? And so after we see these end training cases, some machine is going to have to make a decision for the end plus first case when that email shows up about whether to deliver that to the user or filter it. Okay? And that's your classic kind of sentiment analysis uh, situation. Okay? And this raises a bunch of issues that we're going to need to use some combination of judgment and modeling to tackle. Okay? First set of issues basically boil down to what set of things do we include as features. So if we're building a spam filter, what do we use? Do we use counts of all the different words in the emails? Do we use counts of all the characters? Do we use the complete binary representation of the email to be really agnostic? So that X is just one of any number of possible you know, binary uh, uh, stored emails that could come through. And then conditional on the set of features we're going to pick, we're going to have to face the issue that Taddy started with today, which is how are we going to avoid overfitting and finding a really good way to predict what's spam or what's ham in these end training sets, in these end training emails that doesn't do a good job at all of predicting once we go outside the training set. There's over a million words, depending on exactly who you ask in the English language. And if you took an ASCII file with 100 printable characters and said, what are all the possible such ASCII files, there are 95 to the 100th of those. So being totally agnostic and just putting them on a regression model is obviously useless. You're going to have to find some way to reduce the dimensionality of this problem that's just intrinsic to this problem. And that's why this problem has been such a good motivation for uh, uh, so much of the literature in machine learning on this subject. Okay, and so today I'll talk about two applications of this kind of uh, approach. I'm going to talk about uh, using this approach to estimate the partisanship of the news media, where we're going to turn millions of words or phrases into a unidimensional index of media slant or bias. I'll talk about some applications in financial news, where we're going to take data from news or chat room discussions and classify them as, for example, positive or negative, or being in disagreement versus being in agreement. And then tomorrow, Victor and Christian are going to talk about estimating causal effects, taking a really, really big data set and collapsing it down into a low dimensional control for endogeneity, where actually a lot of the conceptual issues are the same as what you come up with, what you confront in your spam filter. Okay, but we're going to use them in a different way. Okay, so 
partisanship in the news media. So there are a bunch of, this is a case where there's a social science question or set of social science questions like how centrist are the news media? Are the news media to the left or to the right of say the typical American? Or what are the economic factors? Like is it the preferences of owners like Rupert Murdoch? Or is it the preferences of consumers like the people who watch Fox News that ultimately determine how Fox News spins the news? Okay, and these are social science questions. These are questions that are not about prediction or machine learning or dimensionality reduction. These are fundamentally just questions about the causal structure of a variable of interest. The problem is just taking, taking Fox News and turning it into a single dimensional index that tells you where Fox News is on some left right spectrum is non-trivial. Okay, taking, we need to take all of the different phrases or images or whatever are the features we care about on, uh, on Fox News or in the Wall Street Journal or in the New York Times and turn that into a number that we know how to do social science with. Okay, and so there's basically going to be two issues that come up in doing this. One is how are we going to construct our training set? That is, how are we going to get a set of documents whose partisanship we can consider known to the researcher? Okay, are we going to have research assistants go through and classify documents? Are we going to run surveys of individuals asking them to rate documents or rate news outlets or what? And then we're going to confront this issue of dimensionality. What features are we going to look at? Are we going to use the images or the captions of the images or phrases or words or whatever? And how are we going to have a model that's parsimonious? Takes those millions of phrases and throws away most of them to find where the strongest signal is. So Gross, Close, and Milo, which is a very important paper in this area, solve both of these problems in a creative way. Okay, they use as their training set the US Congress. What they observe is, well, for people in Congress, based on the kinds of roll call vote methods that Taddy talked about, we already think we know their ideology. That is, we think we can array them pretty well on a scale from left to right. Okay? We obviously know their political party, so that's a start, and we can probably do even better than that. So we can easily assign a scale or ideology score to members of Congress based on roll call voting. Let's call that Y. Okay? And we can use that ideology score to construct our training set. Because if we can find the features of congressional speech that are predictive of a congressperson's ideology, we can apply those, that same logic to the news media and identify features that we can use to, to array news outlets on a left-right spectrum. Okay? The next thing that they have to do creatively is address the problem of dimensionality. They can't use all the words and have some giant regression model. So what they do Going back to what Matt said is they reduce dimension by hand. Okay, they basically say, well, let's find a feature that's probably used in congressional text and is also used in the news media that we think is probably diagnostic of the speaker's ideology. And what they do is they look at think tanks, which are cited by members of Congress in their floor speeches, and are also cited by news outlets as authoritative sources on issues. And they say, well, think tanks, because we know that some think tanks are to the right of other think tanks, citations to think tanks are going to be a good indicator of the ideology of the citer. Okay, if I tend to cite the Heritage Foundation a lot, that probably makes me more right wing than somebody who's citing, I don't know, the ACLU a lot or, or people for the ethical treatment of animals. Okay, so they're using an ex ante criterion to reduce dimensionality. So what do they actually do? Because one of the things I wanted to do is highlight just the practical details of how this actually gets done. Okay, so what they do is they go, or they have a research assistant go to the searchable index of the congressional record online, okay, which is freely available, of course, anybody can do this, and they execute searches for the names of different think tanks, like the Brookings Institution. Okay, so they will search for all instances of the phrase Brookings Institution, and then they'll go and figure out who's referencing them. Okay, so the congressional record, just to take a step back, that's a transcript of everything that was said in the floor of the House and Senate in the US, plus a little bit of other stuff. Okay, so here's an example of what might come up if you search for Brookings Institution in the 105th Congress. Here's a speech by Dorgan from North Dakota saying a study by a tax expert at the Brookings Institution says if you have a national sales tax, the rates would probably be over 30%. Okay, so Dorgan is using Brookings Institution as an authority, and that goes into their data set. Plop, drop that down to your data set. Now you have one hit to think tank Brookings Institution by Speaker Dorgan. Okay? And they go into exact same, the exact same procedure with an online index of news media text and count references to these same think tanks in the news media. Okay? Then they need a modeling framework to turn these think tank counts into a number. 
And so what they do is they take an ideology score for every member of Congress. It's called the ADA score. And it goes from zero most right wing to 100 most left wing. The source of the data is not that important for our purposes. And for every, and let, they let X be an indicator for Senator I citing Think Tank J on occasion T, and they model X with a logit link to ideology. Okay, so every Think Tank J is going to have an overall popularity alpha, okay, which is going to index how often in general it's going to be spoken. And then it's going to have a kind of ideology weight beta, which tells me how much more often is this think tank cited by people who are more uh, uh, left wing according to this ADA score. Okay, so beta is going to tell me kind of the ideological weight of the think tank. Then they're going to assume the exact same modeling structure is applicable to the news media, and they're going to estimate the alpha for every think tank, the beta for every think tank, and the Y for every outlet in their data set of news media using maximum likelihood. Okay. No penalization necessary because they've already reduced the dimensionality of the data significantly. In fact, they go further than reducing it to the number of think tanks because some think tanks are used rarely. They group uh, uh, about 150 of them into six groups, so they end up with 44 think tanks and six groups of similar think tanks, which I think they call mega think tanks. Okay, so they have about n about 500 some observations, members of Congress, less those who uh, never cite a think tank, and then they have a dimension p, which is about 50, so the number of think tanks that they include. Okay, and so from here they just do unpenalized maximum likelihood because the dimensionality is is kind of small enough to make that method credible. Okay, and what do they find? So these are the uh, ADA scores. Remember, higher score is more liberal. These are the ADA scores for some senators. Okay, And so you have John McCain, who's to the right of our inspector, who's to the right of Joe Lieberman. And then these are the ADA scores that they estimate for news outlets. Okay, And so here's the ADA score for Fox News. It looks like it's somewhere between John McCain and Arlen Specter. And the New York Times looks like Joe Lieberman. Okay, this is a plot of a bunch of their data, okay, and uh, uh, what we're doing here is plotting the ADA score from high to low. We've arrayed it so that uh, uh, high scores go on the left to uh, uh, align with the usual left-right notion of the political axis in the U.S. And so the Washington Times, which is a very Republican outlet or a very right-wing outlet, is all the way on the right here. But the other thing that they emphasize about their data is that these news outlets are all clustered to the left of the Congress people. So one of their main, from a social science standpoint, one of the main conclusions that they argue in this paper is that the news media are uh, centered to the left of the average member of Congress. Okay, and that's a major social scientific conclusion that they uh, 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 that they reach in the paper. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me pause and take a question. Yeah. Question. Right. 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 So the question is, what if the, the underlying factors that cause me to use to cite a think tank differ between the news media and members of Congress? So maybe the news media use think tanks to criticize them and members of Congress don't. So criticism per se, they actually address in the way they construct the data. So they actually construct non-cynical, straightforward references to these think tanks as authorities. But in general, anything that creates a difference between the way that these think tanks are cited in Congress and the way they're cited by the news media means that this modeling approach might not be correct. And that's going to be a theme through uh, the work that I'll talk about next, which is by Matt and me. So it's not specific to their paper. You're using the Congress as a training set. And so that's only valid if the same DGP applies, the same data generating process applies to your training set as your target. If that's not true, then this approach is no longer going to have the nice properties you'd like it to have. So it's important for what they're doing and what I'll show you. We, we did that the same data generating process is applicable to both members of Congress citing think tanks and outlets in the news media citing think tanks. So that's a good question. 
Okay, and so to continue a little bit the story and show you a different cut at the same basic problem, we were interested also in constructing a, an index of the partisanship of news media. And we did it in a way that involved automated feature selection. So that's one of the main differences between uh, the way we, we did this and, and Gross Skills and Milo. So we had a scripted pipeline that basically, basically a script that went online, downloaded the US congressional record, another script that would identify, split up the text according to speech and identify who's speaking at every point in the text. Then another script that would count all two or three word phrases so that for every speaker we know how often they use every two or three word phrase. Okay, and so then we're, we're left with this big soup of phrases. There's a, like a high dimensional uh, uh, data set there and we have to reduce it somehow. Just like Roscos and Milo, we assign every member of Congress an ideology score. In this case, we use the partisanship of their constituents, although you can also use the ADA score or, or, or some other roll call voting based measure. And to reduce the dimensionality of the problem, we computed a simple frequency table of phrase counts by party, and we computed the chi-squared statistic for the independence between party and the use of a phrase, the same one that Taddy defined earlier. And then we identified the 1,000 phrases with the highest chi-squared. So the 1,000 phrases that, in a statistical sense, are on their own most diagnostic of the speaker's party. Okay, so what does that produce? This is from a leaked memo that went out to Republican congressional candidates telling them what to say. And it said, when you're talking about social security reform, never say privatization or private accounts. Instead, say personalization or personal accounts. Because two thirds of America want to personalize social security, but only one third want to privatize it. Okay, why? Personalizing social security suggests ownership and control over your retirement savings, while privatizing it suggests profit motive and winners and losers. Okay, so Republicans had decided strategically to use the phrase personal accounts and eschew the phrase private accounts. And actually, that shows up very clearly in the data. Personal accounts are used 48 times by Democrats in 2005, but 184 times by Republicans. Private accounts are used 542 times by Democrats and only five times by Republicans. So what does that mean? That means if you tell me nothing else about a speaker except that that person said private accounts at some point in 2005, I pretty much know that person is a Democrat. Okay, and indeed, when we construct our list of the most partisan two or three word phrases, the phrase private accounts jumps to the top of the list as the most partisan uh, democratic two word phrase in the data set. Likewise, on other topics, Republicans talk about the war on terror, Democrats talked about the war in Iraq, Republicans talked about the death tax and tax relief, Democrats talked about tax breaks and tax cuts for the wealthy. Okay. Then after we identified our set of the thousand most diagnostic phrases, we were able to count them in newspapers using the same kind of search interface that Matt talked about. So here we're searching on newslibrary.com for the phrase personal retirement account in the Washington Times. And what we find is that, I don't know if this is too light to see, but you can see right down here it tells us the number of hits. So our little script goes and grabs that number. Okay, there are 54 references to uh, personal retirement account in the Washington Times in 2005. And we move on to our next search. Okay, similarly using other interfaces. Okay, and indeed it turns out phrases like this are used in the news media in a way that is consistent with our intuitions about the partisanship of the outlets. So here's the Washington Post talking about Bush's private accounts, and on the exact same day, the more conservative Washington Times talking about personal accounts. Okay, June 23rd, 2005. Okay, so then just like Roscoe and Milo, we write down a model, in this case a linear model, that relates how often I use a given phrase to my ideology. And we can estimate the intercept and the slope in that model using data from the Congress, where we know the speaker's ideology, and then apply the same model to infer the ideology of newspapers. This kind of linear model is called marginal regression, sometimes also known as the first partial least squares direction. We didn't know any of that when we did this, but now, thanks to Taddy, we do know. Um, so this is a, a, a you know, well-known procedure that's, that's been out there for a while. It's basically just a way to construct a linear index of your x's that hits your, tries to hit your y as best as possible. And so when we do that, we get an index, which we call the slant index, which arrays newspapers from left to right. And we went and tried to validate that against other sources. So here's uh, the scatter plot of our slant index against survey results from a website called the Mondo Times, where users went online and rated news outlets as conservative or liberal, and there's some positive correlation there. And that raises a good question, which is, 
Once you do something like this, how do you know if it's working? Okay, how do you know if it's, if it's doing what you want it to do? Obviously, for Congress, the answer to that question is easy in some sense. We can go and do out of sample validation to see if it's working, getting us what we want for members of Congress. Is it doing a good job of predicting, say, their roll call voting? Okay, but for news outlets, we don't have an analog of their roll call vote. So we have to come up with other ways to try to see whether what we're getting makes sense. Okay, one way is what I showed you, which is look for external sources that have rated news outlets. Another way is to look at the lexical content of the phrases themselves and say, do these phrases actually seem to correspond to partisan or ideological issues the way I'd like? Just like with any research you want to do sensitivity analysis, change how you're measuring your why or uh, change the set of phrases that are into your X and make sure you're not seeing explosive sensitivity to small changes in your design. Look for agreement across different sources. So we had a couple different sources for news text and we went and checked that they were basically giving us similar, very highly correlated results. And then of course the last thing you definitely want to spend some time doing is looking at the newspapers. So look at the text surrounding the uses of these phrases that you're finding as highly diagnostic and see whether they're being used in the way that you think or whether personal accounts or retirement or private accounts are being used in some totally apolitical how-to or self-help context. So way back in the back of our published paper is an audit of a whole bunch of uh, search results where we had people go through by hand and, and classify them. Okay. And now that we have a measure, I won't spend most of my time today on the social science, but just to highlight that these data are not there for them for just to sit there, but they're there to go and test social science hypotheses. Now that we have a measure that tells us for each news outlet to what extent is it slanting the news to the right or to the left, we can go test economic hypotheses. Okay? We can use it to model newspaper ideology and ask questions like, what are the economic factors that drive whether a given news outlet slants the news to the right or slants the news to the left. Okay, and we can try to assess questions like, to what extent are news outlets responding to their consumers, or to what extent is their ideology associated with the political affiliations of their owners, and what have you. Okay, so let me give you one example of a, a somewhat substantive result from the paper, which is that uh, the slant index is very positively correlated with the political orientation of the news outlet's audience. So if I'm in a Republican market, I cover the news in a more Republican way. Okay, so this is the y-axis here is purely based on text. The x-axis here is based on voting in presidential elections, and indeed there is a positive correlation. Now, I don't want to belabor this, but I just want to pause to mention that we need to keep our social science hats on throughout this exercise. So the fact that we use some dimensionality reduction method to get this number doesn't tell us that we don't have to worry about all of our favorite things to worry about when we look at correlations like this. Like maybe there's reverse causality. Maybe it's the news outlet's coverage of the news that's changing how people vote. Or maybe slant is actually a proxy for some other attribute of the newspaper, like the extent to which it's picking, it's, it's covering business topics rather than sports topics. And maybe that's also correlated with how people vote in the news outlet's market. And so what we're seeing here has nothing to do with politics. It's just a proxy for some third thing. Or maybe, maybe an even deeper problem is slant itself is a proxy for other attributes of the market, okay? It's like geography. So what do I mean by that? Well, what we're showing here is that in places that vote more Republican, the news, newspapers use more Republican-sounding language, okay? But that could mean a lot of different things. For example, these are data on where uh, in the U.S. different phrases are used as generics for soft drinks, okay? And in the part of the country that I'm originally from, we correctly refer to that as soda. In the part of the country where I now live, I have to order it under the name pop. And there's also places in the United States where I have not lived where it's referred to as a Coke, even if it actually isn't made by Coca-Cola, which is by far the strangest, okay? <laughs> and if we were to construct a naive slant index and say, well, which, which members of Congress say Coke and which members of Congress say soda, we might find, wow, the, the slant index is very correlated with other measures of congressional ideology because people from the people representing constituencies in the South are going to be more Republican. And it's very correlated with uh, the ideology of the, uh, 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 of the home market when we look at news outlets' use of the phrase, of the word soda versus Coke. So we might conclude that there's a tremendous correspondence between how a news outlet spins the news to the left and to the right uh, and how its audience uh, would like to see the news spun, but that might be totally spurious. It might just be a geographic confound. Okay, so we want to be very aware of the soda versus pop kind of confound. 
and worry about it the same way we would worry about in any kind of social science endeavor, control carefully for geography when we relate slant to other economic variables. And also, um, and this is something that's actually very easy to do with the kinds of methods that Taddy's developed, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, we could incorporate geography directly into our predictive model. So when we're doing our dimensionality reduction, rather than trying to predict, say, roll call votes, we could try to predict a component of roll call votes that's orthogonal to region, or orthogonal to division, or orthogonal to regions that correspond to linguistic divisions in the US, and try to orthogonalize from the get-go with respect to those factors to try to isolate the part of the partisanship variation that's really what we want. Okay, so same tactics we'd use in other kinds of social science applications. Okay, and that's just a broader lesson that something that's probably important to keep in mind, although it's, I assume it's common sense, is that you know I think we're going to see more and more predictive modeling of the kind that we learned about this morning used as an aid to social science. But just like with anything else, you get what you put in. So. If your predictors are all going to pick up, create mechanical correlations with things like geography, then that's what you're going to pick up when you go to do your social science. And you need to keep your social science hat on and worry about bias and misspecification when you're designing your predictive model or your dimensionality reduction strategy, just like you do when you take your low dimensional summary and go use, use it to do social science. Okay. Last paper that I'll talk about in the stream on trying to measure partisanship from text is a paper that Taddy wrote. Okay, and he tries there to address, at least the way I think about it, is two big limitations of what we did. One, we separated feature selection from estimation in doing our predictive model. So we had this chi-squared statistic which told us which phrases to include, and then this linear model which told us how to include them. And then two, which touches on the topic that Taddy left us with, he takes advantage of the fact where he tries to, to address the fact that the linear model doesn't do a good job of exploiting the multinomial structure of the data. Some phrases are used very rarely or not at all by some people, and so linearity is actually not a great fit here. Okay, and so what does he do? He actually uses something that in terms of the modeling structure, the economic model is basically the same as the gross gross and Milo model. It's a logit link to uh, uh, an underlying linear model that says my propensity to use a phrase is a function of some intercept and then some slope with respect to my ideology. The difference is he's going to estimate this via penalized maximum likelihood. And he's going to use a log penalty, one of those concave penalties for regularization, and combine that with a novel math algorithm for maximization that makes it fast. Why is that appealing? It's appealing because now we can use Groskos and Milo's model, but we, can, we don't have to use their data. We don't have to pick 50 think tanks. We can go and hit this with the entire congressional record and let the model select the phrases that matter using exactly the kinds of penalized methods that Taddy talked about earlier today. Okay, and the penalty is going to impose sparsity in your betas, so it's going to throw away a lot of phrases, and that means we can basically comfortably hit the model with tons of data and still uh, get good out of sample performance. Okay, and this is actually very nice. I wish we had it when we were doing this because in principle you could even tune your penalty if you only have time, say, using your search interface to search for a thousand phrases, you could even tune your penalty so that it gives you the thousand most predictive phrases, the lasso model, the, the best lasso with, the, with, with a thousand phrases or less, so that you can basically maximize performance in terms of fit subject to a constraint on the number of searches you're able to do online. So you can really take a very decision theoretic approach to research design. Okay, and so just to give you a sense of the performance, this PLS, that's that's kind of what we did. It's actually a little bit better than what we did um, because Taddy uh, standardized the data, um, and his method blows our method away both in terms of the central tendency of the quality of the fit, this is the out of sample predictive correlation, and also the spread. So it also has many fewer really bad outcomes. And it beats a lot of the uh, other things that are out there in the literature, like latent Dirichlet allocation, which, which uh, Matt Jenska will talk about in, in a little bit. Um, and Taddy has now horse raced this against you know, everything. This slide is just, this is sort of Taddy versus the world. Um, and it does really, really well against a wide range of alternatives. So here in blue, we've got multinomial inverse regression. That's, that's Taddy's model. And then these other horses are other people's. And the other thing you can see here, this is time to fit in seconds using data from the 109th Congress. Um, and it's really, really fast. Okay, 
So it's fitting in, in basically on the order of a second, um, which is actually getting you, so you're getting actually better performance in terms of prediction and better speed than alternatives. So it's basically pushing out the frontier in terms of validity and uh, runtime. Let me take questions before I go on and talk about finance applications. Yeah, I saw you first. Oh, yeah, so just a quick question. Yeah. Can you talk about one more time how you're relaxing the linearity assumption that, and how you're getting this increased performance? Um, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, how, so the question is, how is this method relaxing the linearity assumption? So I'll go back through the slides. So what, what Matt and I did, what Jensko and I did, so that's why I call it Taddy Taddy for better, no, better, better notation. Um, what we did is this marginal regression approach where we treat the expected fraction of the time you will use f a given phrase, J, as linear in your ideology. Okay? And in reality, of course, phrase use is more naturally modeled as a count. So you need a count model with something, and you know, a natural thing to do is a logit link. Okay, and that, because that, that's kind of convenient and tractable and shows up all over the place. And so that's uh, 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 how the, the model is getting better performance, basically. And that's a multinomial logit? This is a multinomial logit, exactly. So an I is a person and a J is a phrase. So this, is, this can be for you know, an arbitrary number of phrases. Good question. Steve. Right. So, so Steve's question, so everybody hears it, and so the folks at home hear it, uh, is basically um, suppose, for example, that what's really going on is not that uh, centrist news outlets are somewhere in the middle. They would sound like a middle of the road congressperson, but really what they're doing is putting, say, 50 50 weight on extreme Republican and extreme Democratic ideas. Then that's going to show up as middle of the road in this single index, but maybe that's not the right representation of the world. And in fact, the right representation of the world might be multidimensional. So there might be, say, left, right, but there might also be, you know, balanced versus not balanced or something like that. And so that would give you something like, you know, basically a factor structure or a topic structure. There's like the, you know, uh, neutral topic, there's the right wing topic, there's the left wing topic, and then news outlets differ in the weights they put on those things. And, you know, uh, yeah, none of this work that I'm talking about in terms of the social science research addresses that. There are basically two ways that you could do it. One is you could, again, you'd have to find a training document. That is, you'd have to find somebody, maybe a congressperson, or maybe another source of, say, non-political text that you wanted to say was kind of representative of what it means to be neutral or non-political. So you could get a recipe book or something like that, or you know, Better Homes and Gardens, and put that in your training set, and then use that to train two dimensions. Okay, and that's not, technically that's not problematic. So you could fit that into Taddy's framework, that would be no problem. The other thing you could do is you could take a more um, agnostic approach and just go looking for factor structure. Uh, and that's also technically possible, but much, I think, much less likely to succeed because you're going to pick up whatever dimensions of correlation show up. So yeah, I think conceptually not problematic to do. I haven't seen anybody do that. And I think the hardest thing would be finding a training data set that would, that would permit that. So uh, the question is, how do you handle typos or different spellings for the same word when you have text data? Okay, and I'll give you two answers. Okay, the first question I'll interpret you to mean me, um, and I, the answer is I ignore those. So those are going to show up as just rare phrases that you know, uh, because assuming typos are, are kind of idiosyncratic, they're not going to show up very often. I don't think, for example, any of the phrases that pop out as the most partisan in our data, as I recall. Are, are just misspelled garbage. 
Um, there are some things that are weird, but they're not, they're not typos or misspellings. Um, then another answer would be, how could you do it? A really simple thing that you could do if you, if you had a data set that, say, was OCR'd, so it was filled with typos and you wanted to kind of handle those, you could try to impose some kind of model on the phrases or the words. That's hard. That would add a lot of, like, another modeling layer. Another thing you can do that's not hard is you can use basically a machine implementation of distance between phrases and group similar phrases together. So for example, there's a, there's a metric which I think is called Levenstein distance, is that right? Which is basically a, me a measure of how different two words are, which is used to correct things like, or it's, it's related to more sophisticated approaches that are now used to correct things like, you know, typos in your address or something. Try to figure out whether J-E-S-S-I-E Shapiro and J-E-S-S-E are the same person or not. And basically this measures, say, how many steps would it take to get from one to the other? So how many things would you need to transpose or add or subtract? So you could use those and you could group things according to similarity. And if it were me and I had a document like that, I'd be inclined to do that um, outside of my modeling. That is, I'd be inclined to just try to use a pre-processing step that collapses things in, in, in some distance metric. This is something related to an earlier question about uh, the criticizing a, a think tank. Uh, how about if, uh, say, the, the Democrats use a Republican term in a pejorative uh, is there any way to uh, catch such uh, usage? So the question is, what if Democrats use Republican phrases in a pejorative way, like they say the so-called death tax, or what Bush would like you to call the personal retirement account? That obviously is going to create noise in this measure. Um, and the, the question is, what can you do about that? Okay. And, and again, I'll give you the two answers. So, so we did nothing about that. Turns out sarcasm is rare enough that, uh, that this index performs OK, even if you don't worry about it. You could worry about it. There are, I've seen a couple different ways to do things like that. One is what Gross, Close, and Milo do, which is when they're counting the phrases, they actually explicitly look out for stuff like that. So if somebody says, you know, those jokers at the Brookings Institution would have you believe blah, 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 they don't count that as a reference. That's obviously a great idea. Uh, but time intensive, so it takes work. You could also use, um, there are basically dictionaries of you know, word meaning. So if you could look at, say, the surrounding phrases or the surrounding words and look for indicators of you know, hostility or negativity or sarcasm. You know, my casual impression, this isn't, I don't have a scientific basis for this, my casual impression is the, 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 those things are kind of net okay if what you care about is actually measuring negativity, but if what you care about is filtering your data to make them useful for something like this, they probably add more noise than they subtract. So I personally wouldn't do that, but because those measures are just not yet refined enough. Someday, when Siri actually knows what we're saying to her, then we can, and when she gets it when we're making a joke, then we can ask Siri to filter the stuff, and, and I think someday we will see things like that that work much better. Right now, my impression is, you know, maybe if you're totally at the frontier, but every time I've ever played with something like that, I found it's just, you know, basically adding another source of variability. Okay, and that's actually a good segue um, into analysis of financial news, because actually some of these sentiment issues, literal sentiment, positive, negative, and so on, are big, uh, in big play there. Okay, so. Here it's very easy to motivate the social science questions. It uh, doesn't take any work the way maybe it does with uh, politics in the news media. We want to know as economists what explains the time series and the cross-section of equity returns. That would be great. Okay? And we've made some progress in the last you know, half century or so, but there's probably some more we can make. And in particular, maybe a narrower question is, we see the market move a lot. It moves in response to things that are not captured in quantitative fundamentals that are in CompuStat, like earnings. What is going on? What is the information out there? And one place people have gone to look is textual data, like the news media. A very nice paper by Paul Tatlock counts all words used in the Wall Street Journal's abreast of the market column, okay, which is kind of a column talking about you know, what's going on in the markets these days. And he counts words to con construct his feature set. He counts how often words show up that are bundled in each of 77 semantic categories by what's called the Harvard Four General Inquirer. Okay, so it's, it's Harvard branded, so you know it must be awesome. And so this, this categorizes f words into things like weak or positive or negative. So weak words are things like abandon, abandonment, abdicate. 
Okay, so if like, I don't know, if a CEO or a stock is abdicating something that's bad, that's, that's indicating negative sentiment. And then Paul creates three regressors from these 77 categories. One, just a count of weak words, abandon, abandonment. One, a count of negative words, which is an aggregation of a few categories that are not good. And then uh, one that is the first principal component of the 77 categories, which he calls pessimism. So that tends to be loading on negative things. So it's a different way to aggregate the phrases or the words. Here, Paul's deciding which categories are negative. Here, a principal components analysis is deciding which categories basically get collapsed down into a single dimension and how. And he finds that negative sentiment in the abreast of the market column predicts at least short run negative movements in uh, aggregate equity returns. Okay, Antweiler and Frank do something related, a little bit more like our spam filtering example. They have data from, the, uh, from message boards on Yahoo Finance and Raging Bull. So here's somebody saying that this, this, this whatever this security is, is going to do very badly. Okay, and they have millions of these kinds of uh, chat room discussions or millions of these exchanges, and they need to turn them into some number. So what they do is they count all the words that are used. And then they create a training set of 1,000 of them, which they classify as buy, sell, or hold. Okay, So using the standard kind of you know, mad money lingo, um, but without all the sound effects. And, um, and then they compute, they use a machine algorithm called naive Bayes classification to classify uh, things that they don't have in their training set. So now we have a thousand things in our training set. We have, say, a million things out there in the world. We want to classify them all as buy, sell, or hold. We use this naive Bayes method. And what is naive Bayes? It's just my posterior guess of which of the three categories you belong to under some naive assumption that the words are independent, which, of course, is not true. You couldn't write down a coherent model of words in which they would be literally independent in the statistical sense. But this, this uh, pr procedure actually turns out to do OK in practice. People have used it a lot in lots of applications. Um, and so you know, it does OK on their training set. And so then they can go and use it to, to classify lots of things and do social science and ask questions that are relevant in finance, like how predictable are returns from these chat rooms? Not surprisingly, based on the grammar and spelling in these chat rooms, these are not people who are industry insiders. And the predictability and returns based on these chat room discussions is not so great. So you shouldn't go and construct a Raging Bull or Yahoo message board portfolio right now and trade on it. But they are pretty predictive of volatility. And an interesting uh, angle is they use them to construct a measure of disagreement. To what extent are the recommendations differing a lot across people? And that actually turns out to predict volume, which is interesting to them because there's an existing body of economic theory that predicts such a relationship. And so they can use this as a test when usually measuring things like disagreement among investors is quite difficult. So here's a way to assess that in an automated way from a rich data source. Okay, there are lots of other examples in finance and accounting. There's a paper by Lee that uses this exact same naive Bayes kind of method to measure the sentiment of forward-looking statements in 10 Qs and, and 10 Ks. Hanley and Hoberg use a cosine distance metric, which is basically just asking how similar are all the Xs to measure revisions to IPO prospectuses. And then both of these papers don't just stop there. They go on to test meaningful social science questions using the scores they construct with these methods. Okay. Any more questions before I turn it over to Matt Jensko? Okay, all yours. Okay, so the last of these text applications we wanted to talk about are topic models, returning to something that Matt mentioned right at the end of his discussion earlier this afternoon. So to remind you, one of the distinctions that he made was between supervised and unsupervised methods. Supervised methods where we're reducing dimension, choosing x's that give us the most predictive power for some outcome variable y. Unsupervised methods where there is no y, there's only x, and we're looking for the low dimensional representation which captures as much of the variation x as possible. That's PCA factor models uh, and related methods. And so topic models fall into that unsupervised category, typically. Um, so there are uh, lots of examples of applications of, of 
dimension reduction in general, the congressional roll call votes into common space scores is one we talked about. An important one in psychology is, is the literature on personality in psychology is largely based on, on factor models where you give people some long questionnaire that asks them lots of questions about how they behave and how they feel and what, what they do, and then do some kind of principal components analysis. And there's something called the big five factors in psychology, which basically says most variation in people and how they answer, you know, are you the life of the party or do you like to sit in the corner and do you, <laughs> you know, like playing with your kids or not like playing with your kids? If you ask people a thousand questions like that, most of the variation is captured by these five dimensions and those five dimensions then play a big role in uh, a lot of analysis in psychology. So continuing with the theme here in social science, the, 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 those measures are not the goal themselves, but they're then inputs into subsequent social science analysis. We can ask, as we said, how has polarization in Congress changed over time? There's a paper, whole literature actually, asking how these personality measures are related to performance in different jobs. Because if you're hiring people for jobs, you might want to use them as, as, as a potential uh, way to select job candidates. And topic models, as Matt said, extend basically factor type methods to multinomial data taking advantage of that functional form or, or uh, using a model which is specific to that functional form so it can handle the fact that there are a lot of zeros. So in what context is it useful to think about collapsing high dimensional text data into topics, into a low dimensional set of these factors as opposed to using it to predict stock returns or something else? You might want to know what are people talking about on social networks in some general sense, what products are similar on Amazon or eBay. This is actually a huge problem for like, like a, a big thing that eBay spends a lot of time thinking about is how can we group things together, kind of we have a million different products, we want to be able to show people things that are similar, how do you do that? What stories are in the news today? So if you go to Google News and search for something, Google News will show you, or just go to the homepage of Google News, they show you a bunch of news topics and then associated news stories from lots of different sources. So it'll say there was a train crash in Paris, and then you can read the New York Times story about that or the Wall Street Journal story about that or the uh, Le Monde story about that, whatever you want. That's based on a topic model algorithm whose goal is to say start with the million news stories we see today and group the ones that are similar and, pr and on, on, with the goal of grouping together things that are about the same underlying news event. Um, we might ask if you take the text of economics journals, what are the topics that economists are studying? How has that changed over time? How is it related to their characteristics, etc.? So as with everything, this is most interesting as an input into subsequent analysis. You could imagine studying, for example, how the, the weights on different topics in Twitter predict stock movements, which products are close substitutes for the kind of goals that eBay has. In, in the context of our uh, paper that Jesse talked about, something which we have long wanted to do and never succeeded in, in doing well despite working on it for a while, is you know that slant index is is really a combination of two things. There are synonym pairs like death tax and estate tax. And so the slant index picks up when you talk about death slash estate taxes, which term do you choose? But it also picks up a lot of what do you talk about? So words related to poor people and unemployment, words related to African Americans, a whole bunch of topics that are really associated with Democrats. And then things related to foreign policy, things related to finance, there are a whole bunch of topics that are associated with Republicans. And our slant index, because of the way it's constructed, captures both of those. So a newspaper that we classify as right wing could be a newspaper that when it talks about taxes says death tax, but could also be a newspaper that spends a lot of time talking about foreign policy. And you might like to decompose those things and say, let's separate which topics does a congressperson talk about or a newspaper talk about from when you talk about foreign policy, which terms do you use? That would be a natural application of topic modeling. You could ask how the distribution of topics in economics has changed over time. I think a, a characterization of the very small literature in social science that applies topic modeling is it hasn't really gotten much beyond the descriptive measurement stage. So this, 
application into subsequent analysis, I'm not going to talk much about because I, people haven't really done that yet. There's, the, it's, topic models have still largely been applied as a, in, in that kind of descriptive mode, the second category I talked about earlier. Um, so I want to walk you through two papers that apply topic models to, uh, to text of interest to social science. The first is a paper by Bly and Lafferty from 2006, which is based on the text of Science Magazine. So they're basically trying to say, can we use an automated method to throw in all of the text of all of the articles published in Science Magazine from 1880 to 2002 and group them together to, to, to determine what are the underlying topics uh, and ask questions about them. So practically, what, do, what are they doing? They start with the full OCR text of science from 1880 to 2002, which they get from JSTOR. Notice this is a case where they're not working through a search interface. They have the full text on their computer. That's important. I said, as you'll recall, that there's always a manual step of dimension reduction before the automated step of dimension reduction. So here they first of all only look at words that are used 25 or more times so they throw out all of the words that are used more rarely than that they remove stop words remember those are things like the and uh that occur very frequently based on just a standard list so when people say they drop stop words that means i just i took a list somebody else came up with of stop words and i dropped those and they did this thing called stemming which combines economists and economists into the same word that leaves them at the end of the day with a P. The wide dimension of the data is 15,955 words. And the N in the data, the total number of articles, is about 30,000. Right? So this is a case where uh, uh, you know, P is not bigger than N, but, but it's still pretty big. So let me just show you the goal, and then I'll tell you how they got here. So here is the kind of thing that this method produces. So these are, are four of the topics that this model outputs with the phrases that are most common or most common relative to their baseline frequencies in those topics. So you see there's a topic which seems to be about genetics and includes words like genome, DNA, genetic gene sequence, molecular, and so forth. There's a, a topic which seems to be about evolution there's a topic which is about disease and bacteria, infections, malaria, parasites, and there's a topic which is about computers and information and information science. And there are a bunch more. This is just four of them, right? So the, the grouping of these words together into these kind of coherent topics is something that is produced automatically. And here are time series of the frequency of different words within particular topics. So you might say, if I look at articles in science about theoretical physics, how have the composition of theoretical physics articles in Science Magazine changed? And this picture shows you, well, you know, theoretical physics used to involve a lot of talk about force. Recently, it involves a lot of talk about lasers. Sometime in the middle, people talk about relativity, but that's not so interesting anymore. Nobody cares about relativity now. Um, and you could do the same thing here for neuroscience. So nerves used to be a big uh, thing before people knew, I guess, that they were called neurons <laughs> <And> <laughs> when they're in your brain. Um, that's changed. Oxygen was a big thing in the 60s. <laughs> not, not so much anymore. So this is the, this is the goal. So how, how, do we get, how do we get to to this kind of thing and tell you more about what those pictures really are. Um, so the model in this paper, which was, was developed by David Bly and co-authors, is what's called latent Dirichlet allocation. I think both Matt and Jesse mentioned that in, in, in their discussions. Um, and this is really the, the first big step in, in taking these factor type models and applying them to discrete data. So the setup is N here is documents. Think of articles in Science Magazine. P here is words. The data for an individual document I is a one by P vector of word counts. This is this bag of word representation uh, that we talked about. Okay, And so the, 
the, a factor model, not a topic model, but just the kind of vanilla linear factor model, you will recall, says the expectation of x is a linear function of factors. I'm using slightly different notation here, but uh, so theta ik is the value of the kth factor for document i, and then beta k is a vector of loadings that says in factor k how uh, much to each of these p components, what is the expected value of each of these p components. So LDA transforms that into this multinomial model. We're now going to call the value of the factors the weight on the case topic, and we're going to call the loadings the word probabilities associated with topic K. And now XI is distributed multinomial with probabilities determined by this linear function. Okay, and just to, just to remind you, theta IK here is a scalar that says how much of document I is about theoretical physics, how much of document I is about uh, neuroscience, how much of document I is about computers. And beta is in topic K, say theoretical physics, what are the frequencies of each word? Or what is the probability of saying each word? So beta k, which is a one by p vector, is going to have high values for things like relativity in the theoretical physics topic and have low values for things like relativity in the neuroscience topic. Okay. So here's sort of a graphical representation of that. Here is, here is an article. And words are color coded here by the topics by several different in several different topics that they appear high in. So there's that genetic topic, there's a topic about organisms and life science, and there's a topic about computers and computation. Notice that that a really important feature of this model is a given document is in many topics. Right? One document here has has weights on these different topics. Uh, given by these thetas. And so this article is, you know, it's, it's clearly an, an article about something to do with genetics, but they spend some time talking about computers, they spend some time talking about genes, and so we're going to think of it as a mixture of those different things. So the, the way the model works is this document is associated with weights on those different topics, and then eat those weights in turn determine the probability of different words within that document. Or more precisely, if you think of the, the kind of data generating process here that corresponds just to that equation that I wrote down, right? That, that equation I wrote down is a full specification of the model, but you can think of it as a, as a kind of machine that produces science articles. The way that you assume that that machine works is as follows. Each time I want to write an article, I first draw this vector theta of weights on the different topics. And that is going to be drawn from a Dirichlet distribution. That's a distribution on the simplex controlled by a parameter th alpha, alpha is a vector here, uh, that, that uh, determines how that's weighted across the different topics. So, f so I want to write my article. I draw this theta. It tells me this is going to be 50% of the words are about theoretical physics, 25% about neuroscience, 25% about computers. Then for each word in that document, I'm going to first figure out which topic I'm in from a multinomial draw across theta. So it has a 50% chance of being a theoretical physics word and so on. And then once I've assigned the topic, I draw the actual word from a multinomial with probabilities beta. Right? So this is slightly more simple than the process of actually writing articles and publishing them in science. Uh, but as, as usual, as we've been stressing, these very crude representations often give you a lot of traction. So we're ignoring a lot of stuff here, but uh, it turns out to work pretty well. Um, okay, so that's, that's this original LDA model. That's not the model introduced in the paper that we're talking about here. The advance of this paper over the original LDA paper, and here where they're applying it to, when they apply it to Science Magazine, what they're partly interested in is making the model dynamic. So this algorithm, this data generating process, is assumed to be an IID process across every word within a document, and it's IID across every document the draw on the topic proportions. Right? So this says documents in the, from 1880 to 2002, if we applied that model to science, are completely exchangeable. The probability of, of talking about theoretical physics in 1880 must be the same as in 2002. Clearly that's not uh, correct. Both what we talk about and which words we use to talk about a given topic change over time. Um, 
you know, here are two articles from science that are both about photography, but what we talked about when we talked about photography in 1890 is very different than what we talk about when we talk about photography in, in 1977 in this case, and it would be not a very good fit to the data to assume that the probabilities on words in those years were, were the same within this photography topic. So uh, what the authors do in this paper is divide the whole corpus of text into slices by year, assume that within a given year this LDA model holds. So we're going to assume you know, articles in January and articles in December come from the same DGP. But we're going to allow both beta, that's the probabilities of words within each topic, and alpha, which is the Dirichlet parameter governing which topics we choose to evolve over time. And they're going to evolve according to a Markov process where basically you know, they're going to change smoothly and slowly. The model is going to say they're going to choose smooth, change smoothly over time. Um, so there's, there's a whole part of, there's a whole estimation issue here which we're basically not going to talk about. Um, so, you know, Bayesian inference for this model is hard using uh, what I would have, to my very limited knowledge of this stuff, thought of as kind of standard methods. Bly, in this paper that we're talking about, uses something called variational inference, which I can tell you I completely do not understand at all. Um, you know, Matt in the R package, uh, in, in an R package that he wrote that does topic modeling, uses basically map estimation, maximum, like finding the posterior mode, um, just basically like likelihood estimation, and does things very fast that I do sort of understand. Um, and there's something Matt tells me called stochastic degradient descent, which is even better, which is how people today estimate these things. So, uh, in any case, if you actually estimate topic models, you, you need to worry about this a little bit. Um, but the estimates that these guys use come from a model with 20 topics. How did they choose 20 topics? I think they tried 15, they tried 20, they tried 25, they looked at it. 20 looked pretty good. Um, and that, that as, as a parenthesis, I think there's another theme in all of the stuff that we're doing, which we haven't really talked about, which is th there are a tremendous number of kind of tuning parameters and decisions and choices and places where the, the researcher has discretion in implementing any of these kinds of methods. And just as with all of the methods you guys are familiar with, you know if you want to get something to be significant and you're allowed to play around with all different control variables and all different estimation methods and so forth, you know, you, you have a lot of ability to do that. The same thing applies here. How many topics in a topic model is an example of that. That's one of these things where there's not any real theory that grounds, or there is some theory, but, you know, there's, there's, there's not a, a, it's not completely obvious what would be the right metric for choosing that. And in practice, researchers exercise a lot of discretion. And that's true, I think, of any of these models we're talking about. Once you really understand them, you'll see there are a lot of knobs that are turned. And as a consumer of this kind of research, it's important to know what those are. OK, so I showed you this. These are four of the topics. Now, you know which words are chosen to list within each topic are based on the betas. They're the ones that have the highest betas relative to their overall frequency. These are those pictures I showed you before, which now, what are these plotting? These are the beta loadings on these different words in a given topic over time. Right? So because we have that Markov process, it's well defined within the model what is the topic in 2000, which corresponds to a given topic in 1880. Those things are linked over time. And so we can ask both what is the, the how are the proportions of theoretical physics and neuroscience changing? and how are the frequency of these words. Notice that the model does not provide labels like theoretical physics and neuroscience. Right? The model just provides lists of words. This is the authors who have said, well, this thing that has words like force, laser, and relativity seems to be about theoretical physics. So a couple of other results from the paper to kind of illustrate the things that you can do. So here is watching a particular topic evolve over time. So there was a topic in 1880 that included words like electric, machine, power, engine, steam, machines, iron, battery, wire. You can kind of picture what that's about. And you can, you can 
watch that evolve over time. So in, you know, in the 1930s, we start talking about tubes, glass, air, mercury, laboratory pressure. Uh, and by the time we're in 2000, we're talking about, in this topic, which is about machines and manufacturing, we're talking about materials, light, silicon, and so forth. So you can, you can watch this evolution of a given topic over time in which words are important. You can also ask, if I pick an article from 1880, here's an article called The Brain of the Orang. I think that's a kind of monkey. Uh, you can ask, what is the article in some later year that is most similar to it? So what is, you know, can, can I find a, a more recent article that looks similar in the loading on the different topics. So this histogram with no labels is the topic loadings for the brain of the orang across these 20 topics. And here is the article in 1976 that is most close to the brain of the orang in terms of its topic loadings. And it turns out to be something that's also about brains of monkeys. Okay. So again, as I said, none of this is quite getting to applying these measures then to go on and ask causal questions about social science, right? We're stopping here at description, but it's pretty interesting description. And it's turning this completely unstructured text of Science Magazine into something descriptively that tells us a lot about how is science changing, how are the topics changing, what are people studying, what's important, and so forth. Okay. So the last, the second of these, the last thing we'll talk about today before we break uh, for the day is another paper on topic modeling in text by Kevin Quinn and co-authors from 2010. This, like the work on partisan speech that Jesse talked about, uses text from the congressional record. Okay. But here we're not going to apply it to newspapers. What is talked about in Congress per se is going to be the subject. So. The authors used the full text of speeches in the US Senate from 1995 to 2004. That's the raw data. They, like us, have all of the raw data on their computer. So they're not doing searches. So they can, they can do this. You can't do topic modeling if you have to work through a search interface. Right? It doesn't work. They, too, have to do some manual steps, choose to do some manual steps to reduce dimension at the beginning. So they only include words that appear in at least half a percent of all speeches. And, that, and they stem. They don't drop stop words. That leaves them with 3,807 words in 118,000 documents, where a document here is a speech by a congressperson. Okay. And so what are they trying to do? They want to ask, what, are, what is Congress debating? What are the words that are important in different topics, and how are those changing over time? So their model is very similar to the Bly and Lafferty model, except one, instead of this factor type model where every document is a mixture of different topics, their model is going to say each speech in Congress is about exactly one topic. And two, they're going to allow the distribution of topics to change over time. But unlike Bly and Lafferty, the probabilities of words within a topic are going to be constant over time. Those are the two differences. Otherwise, it's the same model. So just to write that out a little bit formally, here's the Bly and Lafferty model, which you already saw. The Quinn et al. model says, instead of xi being multinomial with this linear combination of the betas, it's multinomial with probabilities given by a single beta, that beta assigned to document i. And the probability that that topic is j is given by alpha j. So instead of this Dirichlet distribution from which we choose weights, we have a multinomial distribution of topics. And each document gets each speech gets assigned one topic. And here, alpha will evolve over time, the weights, but the betas will stay the same. And they, so they estimate this using an ECM algorithm. They choose 42 topics. Again, how do they choose 42? They're very explicit in the paper. They tried 35. They tried 45. And 42, based on a variety of criteria, uh, look good. And they actually, I mean, so I want to stress that it's objective. They, if you look at this paper, they actually are quite careful. 
doing, you know, Jesse talked about once you have estimated, say, a slant index, what is a long list of things you could do to go get a sense of whether it's working right and picking up the things that you want it to. They have a similar nice discussion in this paper of ways to validate that this 42 topic model is picking up kind of semantically relevant, coherent topics and do a bunch of different things to, to look about it and talk about conceptually what what is the goal, what would it mean for this to be working well or not working well, which isn't completely obvious. Okay, so here's here's what comes out of this. So, and I mean, again, they're not going to go do anything with it. You could imagine going and doing things with it, but it's kind of cool just on its own. So you throw in the full text of the congressional record for all of these years. And this is what comes out. These are the first 17 of these 42 topics. So there's a topic which they give the label judicial nominations to, and it is associated with words like nominee, confirm, nominate, circuit, hear, court, judge, judicial, case, vacancy. Notice that the funny spellings in these keys comes from that stemming algorithm. right? That's why suffixes are dropped and stuff because they're doing stemming. I'm not, I said that Bly and Lafferty do stemming, and I realized that in those lists of words I showed you, they're not stemmed. So that may mean that, that I was wrong about that, or it may mean that they just rewrote them for clarity. Um, so there's a topic about constitutional things. There's a topic about campaign finance. There's a topic about abortion. You know, these labels are just their labels, but if you look at the actual words, they look coherent. They look like they're picking up the kind of words that we would have assigned, and they're returning the kind of topics that we would have thought, you know, w w we might ourselves divide Congress into. Um, and one of, the, you know, they're not the first people to try to assign topics to bills and to, and to congressional debates. So one of the validation things they do is compare these to uh, some of those previous measures. Okay, so once you have that, once you've divided all speeches in Congress into, remember now, every speech is associated with one topic, and you have that, the weights on those topics evolving over time, day to day, you can ask, how has what it, Congress is talking about changed over the 1997 to 2004 period? So this is... Uh, uh, time series of the frequency of like the total number of words allocated to topics, uh, the total number of speeches in the defense use of force category. That's one of their topics, right? This is number of speeches summed based on their number of words. So the y-axis is number of words. So you see this kind of spiky picture that basically says usually Congress is not talking about defense, but sometimes it talks about it a lot. And if you look at the spikes, they're all associated with days on which Congress was debating something, which clearly was about national defense. So you see the Kosovo bombing, the withdrawal from Kosovo, Kosovo the largest spike in that time series is the day on which they were debating the authorization for the Iraq war. Um, the Abu Ghraib photos being released and discussed, etc. So it seems like this is doing a reasonable job of picking up if the question was, when is Congress talking about national defense? This completely hands-off automated method seems to be doing an okay job. Another one of the topics that comes out uh, is, oh, another set of topics that come, comes out are sort of symbolic bills. This is sort of like the way Matt said, if you look at internet browsing data, it turns out the most important thing is porn. Kind of. By analogy here in Congress, you think that they're debating national defense and abortion and all these things, but mostly what they're spending their time doing is voting on, you know, we commend the firefighters of such and such town for putting out a fire. Um, so one of those, so, so in, if you look at the topics, those things show up really big, symbolic, remembrance type topics. And here's the one for remembering military heroes. What are the spikes in that over time? There's one when there was a shooting at the, at the Capitol in DC. And then interestingly, you see the anniversaries of 9-11. The day after 9-11 is the biggest spike. So 9-12-2001. Then the first anniversary of 9-11 in 2002 is almost as big. The second anniversary is a bit smaller. The third anniversary is even smaller. You see our symbolic discussion of 9-11 on its anniversaries declining over time. Um, and finally, the last thing I'll show you from their paper um, this is a little bit hard to read, but I hope you can see. So another thing you can do with these estimated topics is to try to organize them into a hierarchy uh, 
that shows which topics are more and less related to each other. So the algorithm they follow is as follows. Start with all 42 topics. Compute the distances among them based on just Euclidean distances between those beta vectors. Take whichever two are closest to each other and now combine those into one topic. Now averaging the betas. You now have 41 topics. Repeat. Now you have 40, repeat, now you have 39, and so forth. And, you, and as you've done that, keeping track of what you combined when, that implies a picture like this. Right? And the organization seems conceptually pretty coherent. The, the highest level division, the biggest difference, if you, if you had to sort of draw one line through the space of topics, it separates a bunch of topics that are basically about procedural language. Shall we vote on this bill? I yield the remainder of my time, so on and so forth from everything else. That's, in addition to symbolic stuff, that's the other thing Congress spends a lot of time talking about is procedure. Then you have divisions. This symbolic thing is like the next big group. And then you have everything else, which is actual bills and policy, which is divided at a pretty high level into domestic versus international. And then you have, you know, you can go down. I didn't show you all the way down the hierarchy. But so this, this all seems like it's pretty, it's descriptive. The question is just what does Congress seem to be talking about and how are things related? But it corresponds, the automated, completely hands off, uh, no, no human intervention approach is giving us something pretty close to what we might have come up with ourselves. OK? So that's the last thing I have to say about those applications. Let me take questions. People have any questions about that? Yeah. So, some of you that we are more like discriminatory analysis than current analysis, is this considered still within the methodology of current analysis or is it considered a hybrid? And then a, hi a hybrid with what? Was the uh, factorial analysis and discriminatory analysis in the sense that it seems that we are trying, instead of reducing the number of variables to move uh, observations. I mean, I know it's not exactly that, but it has a, a ring to it. Uh, with this other body of, of uh, dimensionality reduction uh, methodology of, of uh, discriminatory analysis, like profiling situation would be an application of discriminatory analysis. So right. is, is it considered a hybrid? And related to that, if you know, or, or I, I'm not familiar with the literature, but is, is uh, this, uh, like, grouping methodology used uh, uh, as, a, as an input in in analysis, for example, with the analysis, uh, they have mentioned that you can uh, help with uh, multiplicity. So, for example, if we can group observations, maybe we can uh, help to have better focused uh, fixed effects in, in the analysis if we can better define the group. If there's something like that going on in the applications. Um, okay, so the question, the first question was, is it right to describe these models as most closely related to factor analysis? Or are they more related to discriminatory models or kind of clustering type algorithms like you might use uh, in other cases? Let me give you what I think is the answer to that question, and then Taddy can correct me if I'm wrong, which is I, I think, I think that the, the way you would most commonly use the terminology is to say that the LDA model and its variants are in the same family as factor models because you have this linear structure, and so each document is a linear combination of a bunch of factors. And the Quinn et al. model, where we say this is, uh, we're now going to assign each document to a unique topic or a unique cluster, is in the same family as algorithms like k-means clusters and other clustering type algorithms. Is that dead on? Dead on, says our expert. Um, OK. And then your second question was, could these kinds of methods be applied to kind of clustering type algorithms be applied to group observations together in some causal analysis in order to include fixed effects? Uh, and I'm, I mean, I think, I think that, that is an interesting idea of the kind of place that you might uh, do this kind of thing. I'm not aware of specific applications that do that. But that seems like, like in the spirit of the, the ways that you might take something like this. Uh, and you know certainly, certainly if you if you think about you know if if characteristics of the congressional speeches are on the left hand side, and what people are talking about is 
something you want to control for, then it would be natural to include fixed effects for which topic you think it's in according to the Quinn model here as an example. Other questions? Uh, yeah. In in what is the distribution of the beta parameter in the in in the LDA model? Well, in the in the LDA model, the beta parameter is fixed in this in this dynamic ver. So the remember LDA the original model is the static one shot version of that. Um, in the blind Lafferty model where it's dynamic, the roughly the way to think about it is they actually. The, the parameter in their model is not actually beta, because beta here is something that needs to sum to one, it's weights, but they, they transform that basically using a logit. So there's a parameter, think of now a parameter defined on the real line, a vector that's, that, that has domain on the real line, and then the probability or the weight on a given word, the probability of a given word is a logit function of that. And then those parameters that are now defined on the real line evolve by something like an AR1 process. That's the, so we, can, we should look back at the paper to get the exact details right, but that's roughly, it's a little bit harder to write down a natural Markov process for this thing on the simplex evolving over time. It's easy to write down something like an AR1 process for just uh, variables on the real line, so that's what they do, and then they transform it back. Other questions? Yeah. Is probably quite violated. Is this a problem, or am I Or is it not? I, I, I don't have to question. Well, so, so first of all, I don't think there's an independence of irrelevant alternatives assumption. He, the, I mean, the. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. So the question was, in these kinds of topic models, is the independence assumption a problem? It seems likely to be violated, and is does the fact that it's violated, but we're assuming it's true. Uh, cause problems. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I, I guess what I mean, I'm sort of talking about like the red bus, blue bus problem where you can have two topics. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. So in this, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, we don't have the, the logit formula written up. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, maybe we should talk about this. I'm not sure that there is really an analog of the red bus, blue bus problem here. We're assuming independence of words across, across words within a document and a documents within a day. And that is clearly independence which is violated in the data. Uh, and I, th I think that's another example of course model ends up working pretty well in practice. The fact that, that we're modeling these things as, uh, you know, going back, we wrote it up. Um, you know, the fact that we're modeling these as logit probabilities, is, there's just a transformation I don't see, but we could talk about it. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so let me just conclude by telling you. So today, to remind you of the sort of division, today we talked about what are basically predictive models, applications of those models. Tomorrow, Chris Hansen and Viktor Chernozukov will talk about high dimensional data in a context where you're specifically interested in estimating causal effects. So basically, how do I do, we've been talking about selecting variables, for example, in order to get the best predictor of why. That's a different problem from how do you select x variables to get the best control if what you're interested in is a regression of y on a particular x. Because there you care both about how these variables are related to y and how they're related to x. You kind of want to include the ones that are related to both. So they'll talk about the specific kind of modifications of these methods to that context and applications of those things in economics. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.